Okay, let's get started. This is CSCE 611. My name is Jason Bakos. Welcome back. Uh, if we, let's quickly run through the syllabus here and then we'll get started on the first lecture. So section one is the catalog description. Uh, section two is the meeting times. Half of you are in section one and half of you are in section two. Uh, both sections meet here on Monday for lecture and then if you're in section one, you'll have lab uh, on Wednesday, same time. And if you're section two, you'll have lab on Friday. Uh, if um, we have a little space, if you want to switch, like go to the other day's lab, um, I think there's maybe five slots, kind of wiggle room we have. Um, so if you want to do that, that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, and the lab is Swearingen 3D22. It's the Linux lab on the third floor, and there's a combination lock on one of the doors, and I believe the combination is still 45213 if the door is closed. Section three is, lists all the electronic resources for the class. So I use the Dropbox slash Moodle, the departmental Moodle dot, or sorry, dropbox.csc.sc.edu. Sometimes I call it Dropbox, other times I call it Moodle. Moodle is the name of the software that, ru that runs that site. I don't use Blackboard. Uh, so I'll be using Dropbox for, to, to um, uh, for all the uh, downloads, the materials you, you can download, like lecture slides and, and uh, supplementary materials. You'll submit your labs through Dropbox, and then your grades will, will be shown on Dropbox as well. Okay, anyone not know what I'm talking about? You guys all use Moodle, hopefully, but this one? Good. Okay, uh, so my, uh, I record all my lectures and put them on my YouTube channel, so if you miss lecture or you want to hear what I had to say again, you're welcome to, to go there. Uh, we are going to be using software that's installed in the departmental Linux labs. We're using CAD software. That same software is available also in the downstairs lab, 1D43, but the hardware that we use in the class will only be on the third floor lab. There are other courses that are taught in the third floor lab, and as soon as I find out the times, I'll be posting those on, on Dropbox so, so you'll know uh, when to avoid going in there outside of class. And make sure that you uh, check or forward your university email, your email.sc.edu, because uh, it's common for me to, to post announcements on there. And this is a uh, design class, will be in teams of two, so you'll need to find a, a partner to work with on the projects. And each team will need to find a way to collaborate. Uh, so I think most of you guys are familiar with GitHub or Dropbox. Um, Okay, and if you have any issues with Moodle slash Dropbox, you know, any problems logging in, uh, for instance, or any problems with your departmental Linux account, then contact Ryan Austin. He's our IT guy, and his email address is on there. Okay, if we go to section four, is, I've got the textbook listed. This is the textbook. It's a uh, great resource for this class. Um, you could get by without it, but I recommend that you have a copy. Section five is the learning outcomes for the course. So this, in this class, you're gonna learn a, another language, uh, a type of language called a hardware description language. It's called System Verilog. And we are gonna be doing uh, digital design on um, FPGA boards, which I'll talk about uh, shortly. Uh, section six are all of the important dates. So hopefully those of you in section two received my email about the lab on Friday being canceled. Everyone get that? Hopefully no one showed up to lab on Friday. Um, and then all the other important dates, all the other cancellations that I know of are listed there in section six. Okay, section seven are the instructors and teaching assistants. So I'm your instructor. I've got my offices in the story building on the corner of assembly and blossom. It's room 2213. And I'll have two teaching assistants, Soyash Singh, who's up here. I stand up, Soyash, so everyone can see you. And Mehdi uh, Yaguti, and he is a postdoc who's gonna be helping uh, Soyash and I out with the course. Uh, they'll be in the lab, you know, answering questions while you work in the lab. Uh, section eight is the grading structure. So we've got four projects, lab projects. 
and we have a, some quizzes, weekly quizzes that I give out. They're, they're, I give those on, on Moodle, on Dropbox. Uh, and then there's a midterm and a final exam also given on Dropbox. And if you add up all of the weights, uh, the weights add up to 117.5%, which is done so you have the ability to not take the final, right? Or you could opt out of the fourth project, right? That's the idea. So it gives you some flexibility. Uh, so sometimes people in the class might get stuck with a partner who doesn't contribute anything or they, they get behind in the projects because of other courses. Uh, on the other hand, some of the students may be, do really well in the labs and, and you know, they don't do as well in the, the exams, the conceptual material. So this gives you kind of some flexibility to tailor the class, however, whatever fits you best. Okay, uh, now there is a, an additional lab that I have to give out if you're receiving graduate credit or honors credit for this class. So let me know if that's the case. You have to do, to get graduate credit, you have to do extra work beyond what the undergrads do, and that will be the fifth lab. And so the weights are adjusted uh, in that case. So that's the second column. The weights in the second column would apply to you if you're a grad student or if you're getting grad credit, like if, you, if you're in the accelerated master's program. Okay, section nine is the approximate schedule. Uh, this, course, I, I've, this course is relatively stable, uh, so the schedule should be accurate, barring any um, unexpected cancellations. Uh, so I tried to show in the left column what we'll be talking about in the lecture for that week. And the right column is what you'll be doing in the lab for that week. Make sense? Okay, section 10 describes what you need to do if you have a disability that you need assistance for. Section 11 says that we may have to update the syllabus if needed. Uh, for example, if, you know, as I mentioned, if, there was, if there's some cancellations and we need to adjust due dates or even what projects we're, we're doing. Uh, but I'll let you know ahead of time. Uh, section 12 is the grading scales, the standard grading scale I think everyone's used to. Section 13 is the academic honesty policy. This is a little different for this class because we're going to be using industrial CAD tools in this class. And uh, for most of you, it's probably your first experience with, with these types of tools. They're pretty hard to use. They're, um, they're, they're kind of written almost as if like a high school intern wrote, wrote them, even though they're industrial CAD tools. They're used in industry. You know, it's the same tools that, for example, Mercedes-Benz would be using to program any of the 60 FPGAs that run a Mercedes-Benz, right? Um, the, uh, the problem, though, is that the, the people that write those tools are engineers. They're not software people. And so sometimes you use those tools and you're like, I don't know, like, was the guy retarded that wrote this? Like, what's going on? <laughs> like, that's how bad they are. There's error messages that are difficult to interpret. It, the tools crash. Sometimes they take a really long time and they hang. And so I encourage all of you, I always encourage the students to work with each other to resolve issues with the tools or to find workarounds to problems. Um, however, you know, obviously you can't copy each other's designs, okay? So there, sometimes there's a fine line there. Um, but, uh, you know, do, and, and of course, each partner in the groups will be submitting the same projects. But between groups, you shouldn't share any uh, intellectual material, right? Um, but I, it's common to see students getting help from other groups to figure out why the tool is crashing, okay? Okay, um, let's see, that's okay, that's the academic honesty. Uh, section 14, lecture and lab attendance. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, you can. You can, uh, if you need to miss lecture, you can because I record my lectures. Um, although in some cases I lose the recording for like if my voice recorder fills up or whatever. Uh, but even if that's the case, I, you can always go back to a previous semester because the course is relatively the same, you know, from, from year to year. Um, the labs are, the lab times are reserved for you to work in the lab and, and be able to have <coughs> questions answered by the TAs and the instructor. However, it is always the case that the amount of time you're going to have to spend on each project is going to exceed that of the allocated lab time for that project. So you're going to have to come into the lab outside of class, generally speaking. And it is possible to work on these at home, remotely. 
uh, but kind of difficult whenever you need to use the FPGA, the, the, the little boards that we use, the project board. So uh, generally speaking, you have to come to the lab to work. So try to plan times to come to the lab outside of the scheduled lab times. And as I mentioned, there will be other classes taught in 3D22, but I'll post that schedule as soon as I, as soon as I can. Um, okay, section 15 is group work policy. I can't remember, about half of the grade is group work, right? I don't have the total on there. Yeah, um, actually a little, bit, a little bit less than 50% of your total course grade <coughs> is, is a grade that you'll share between the two partners in the group. So both members of the group will receive the same grade, only one member has to submit it, has to submit the, 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 the projects. Uh, but less than half of the total grade is group work. The other half is, is the individual scores you're going to get from the quizzes and exams. Okay, and I designed it that way because it's never the case that both members of the team contribute equally. You know, you're always going to have unequal contributions. So, um, you know, if you feel like you're doing all the work in the group, that's probably okay because your grade will still be reflective of, of what you take away from, from the class. Make sense? Although that being said, you should try to choose your lab partner wisely. If you want to work by yourself, by the way, you can do that. We have, you know, we have only, we have 20 workstations in the lab, so obviously it's limited on how, how many singleton groups we can have. But if you want to work alone, you're welcome to, but you'll be expected to do the same projects as the groups, okay? So you'll be doing the same work that teams of two are doing, right? Um, but I don't mind, you know, single person groups if you, if you really would prefer that. Um, Section 16 talks about project submissions. So we are designing a CPU in this class, and we're, you're running code. You know, you're basically designing a CPU from scratch, as if you were you know, inventing the first CPU, basically. Uh, the problem with that type of project, though, is if there's one bit that's wrong, the whole thing doesn't work, it's a paperweight. So it's really hard to uh, assign partial credit. It's tough. And we have explored many different ways to grade these labs over the years. We've done, you know, we've done like project reports where you kind of just describe your design. We've had cases where you submit it and the TA spends all night running everyone's submission on their FPGA board in our lab. We've had auto graders that we've tried to run against the code, which that was a lot of work, but it was a total disaster because, you know, if one, one cycle off and it would assign a zero, even though everything else works, that sort of thing. Um, the way we've been doing it, now is primarily through demos. So when you finish your, your project, you'll submit it through Moodle, and you have to submit it by the due date in order to not lose, in, or, in order to not have a late penalty, okay? But then at some point after you submit it, you'll demo it in class. You can demo it after, the, after you submit it and after the due date, because the late penalty will be applied to when you upload the code, and then at some point after that, you'll demo it, and we can't assign you a grade until after you demo it, obviously. So it, you know, it makes sense to try to demo it as close as possible to when you uploaded it, but sometimes you can't because we're answering questions and we run out of time in lab and so forth. Okay, so like I said, one, one member of the group uploads it to Dropbox, you're expected to not change it from the point you upload it, and then you'll work with the TAs to schedule a demo and you'll demonstrate your code and we will be uh, using that demo to have you explain how your code works and if it doesn't work why it didn't work and and you can kind of take us through what the problems are and how you uh, tried to solve the problems and that kind of stuff and then we have a rubric that's on every lab sheet that we use to actually assign partial credit okay Does that makes sense uh, so your submission you know when you submit you upload and we're going to run we, we run the submissions through MOS to make sure uh, none of the submissions you know share a significant portion of the code uh, and we use that to signify when, you know, when you're done, right? Um, now, we also have a late penalty that is 5% per school day after the due date, and it's capped at 30%. So that's a pretty, pretty nice late penalty. If, you know, we, we encourage you to wait until you have the project uh, running, even if it's a little bit late. Now, we don't want to penalize you too much, but that also means that you could wait till the end of the semester to, to, do, to, to submit your projects and you only lose 30% on, on all of them. And some people actually will end up doing that this semester. It always happens. I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, you should try to keep pace with, with the schedule. Um, 
each group can only submit one version of each project. You can't do any resubmissions. And uh, there is a cutoff date of December 8th, 1159, which is the last day of the semester before finals week to submit your projects uh, and demo them. Unless there's a, if, if you, if there's kind of a, um, if there's a conflict, we might be able to accommodate a demo after that day, but make sure you submit by December 8th all your, all your projects. Okay, any questions? Okay, good, all right. So let's jump into the first lecture. Okay, so you might be wondering what this class is about. You might have heard some things about it. This class extends the material that you learned in 2.11 and 2.12. Y'all remember 2.11 and 2.12? It's two years ago, I think. Or one year ago, okay. So in 2.11, hopefully, all of you had the opportunity to design digital logic circuits by writing digital behaviors out using Boolean algebra, and then translating that Boolean algebra into a schematic, into a gate level schematic of logic gates and wires, right? Hopefully you guys got to do that in the class. And then um, you might have also minimized the Boolean logic using Boolean algebra minimization or a Carnot map to take the circuit or the expression and transform it into an equivalent expression that's simpler, right? So you learned, basically in that sense, you learned that there's more than one way to, de to implement the behavior of a, of a, of a, digital, of a of digital logic behavior, right? You have an expression that's written out mathematically and you can get equivalent behaviors with different, by transforming the logic and then thus, you know, deploying it with gates in different ways, right? Um, and then once you did that, hopefully you had the opportunity to take each of these gates in your schematic, which are kind of, you know, logical gates, and associate them with physical gates on a TTL logic chip and then wire them up on a breadboard. Hopefully you got to do that, no? Okay. Well, they used to do that. They've been, things have changed a little bit, right? Um, okay. Well, then, so... I'm sure you guys realize, though, you know, if you were drawing the digital logic circuits out on paper, you know, I'm sure you realize that that's not, that's probably not how, you know, real engineers design digital logic. Uh, a modern CPU, and, and this number is actually out of date, um, I tried to figure out, like, how, what would it take to design a modern CPU using the, using the methodology that you used in 211? And uh, I estimated it would take 8 million breadboards that would be it would end up being, if they were, if they were stacked end-to-end, -end, would be a th over a thousand miles long to, to build up the equivalent level of integration, the equivalent number of gates in a modern CPU, right? And the problem with that is even if you could do that, which of course would be impractical, but even if you could do that, you wouldn't be able to, it would be like a big rat's nest, you know, you wouldn't be able to reuse logic. You wouldn't be able to reuse like parts of that in order to come out with the next version of the CPU, right? There'd be no reusability and it would be hard to debug and test, right? So that's not practical. So in this class, we're gonna use a more practical approach. And this is the, as I mentioned earlier, this is the industrial method, right? That's actually used. Um, we are gonna use two, two things. One are field programmable gate arrays, which are chips that are electronically programmable in a way that you can take a digital logic circuit and put them onto the FPGA and have the FPGA suddenly behave as that circuit. It gives you a way to deploy hardware. You know, the FPGA, when you power it on, is basically just a paperweight. It does nothing. It's useless. But then when you, you send in a bit stream, uh, which allows you to program the FPGA to behave as though you had actually fabricated a chip, an actual hardware chip. Uh, the advantage of that is that you don't have to actually fabricate the chip. You're basically creating a, an electronically a programmed version of a digital logic circuit, right? Uh, if, you, if you fabricate an integrated circuit, you have to uh, design it for manufacturing, first of all. So you have to design it at a lower level than, than what we're gonna use. But then you have to send it out and have it, you have to have it taped out, sent out to a, a company that'll make it. And it usually takes, 
you know, several weeks to get back and then you have to test it, right? Uh, whereas an alternative approach is to use an FPGA which allows you to test hardware designs, you know, on, on an existing chip, essentially. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's like, um, it's like a blank slate that can suddenly birth into existence a digital logic circuit and a big one. Now you might say, wait a minute, if that's the case, why would anyone ever fabricate an, an, an integrated circuit? Why would anyone tape out a chip if you could just use an FPGA? Uh, the reason is, is that the FPGA is going to have about a 10 times slower clock uh, than if you fabricated a custom chip. And the number of gates you can fit on an FPGA is about 10 times less than that of an ASIC. So you pay an overhead of about a 10 times slower and 10 times smaller in order to use an FPGA as opposed to fabricating a custom integrated circuit called an ASIC, application specific integrated circuit. Does that make sense? But both, aside from that difference, they're equivalent, right? Uh, in fact, companies like Intel, actually whenever they're coming out with a new processor, they will test it on an FPGA. Like they'll take, or maybe not the whole processor, but pieces of the new Intel processor will be tested by deploying it on an FPGA. Uh, and that, that allows them to test it really fast because they actually have it in real hardware as opposed to simulating it, which would be oftentimes too slow for really large designs, okay? Okay, so uh, that's the one thing. The other thing we're gonna talk about is hardware description language. This is a high level language that you use to create large scale digital logic design. So the idea here is that Boolean logic is too low level to, to use that to design a large scale chip. But this hardware description language allows you to write language in sort of a Java slash MATLAB slash Python sort of high level language syntax that implies the, the underlying digital logic. You, you go through this process called synthesis, which is essentially the same as compiling. We don't call it compiling, we call it synthesis. Logic synthesis, which converts the HDL uh, design into a digital logic design, right? Um, so it gives you one level higher level of abstraction, but it's also reusable and uh, it's easier to debug and read and, and that kind of stuff. The problem is, is that it's different from a, a regular high, high level language in that it has concurrent semantics. So a normal high level language, you know, when you write Java, for instance, you assume that the lines of code are executed in an order, right? They're executed essentially from top to bottom in order. Uh, whereas hardware description language, every line of code is concurrent. So you can take all the lines of code in, in an HDL program and scramble them and it wouldn't make any difference because each line of code represents a digital logic circuit and they're all operating concurrently at the same time as circuits do. There's no sense of sequentiality to the code. So instead of sequential semantics like what Java and Python use, this uses concurrent semantics. So it's a much different type of language but it's still a high level language in the sense that you're writing, you know, kind of text, right? And you've got familiar types of constructs in there, okay? Um, HDL though is kind of a mixture between schematic language where you're kind of defining a schematic in, in, in text. And when I say schematic, I mean you instance things and wire them together, right? That's a schematic. Part of it, a lot, a lot of HDL programming is just that. You're just defining a schematic. You're instancing modules and connecting them with wires, right? That's called structural HDL. And then there's behavioral HDL, which is the lowest level where you actually get in there and you define something that can be translated to a truth table, a Boolean truth table, ultimately, right? Or a, or a memory element or a combination of the two, you know, com combinational and sequential logic, if you remember that from uh, 211, okay? Does that make sense? So there's kind of two different styles and you can mix them up, you know, in the same file. Okay, so there's an example. So. Um, on the left, you can see a blank slate. The FPGA that we're using in the class is on the top. By the way, it's right here. I brought one with me too. They look like this. We have them in the lab. Um, there's a lot of chips on here, but the FPGA is the big one and kind of in the middle to the right a little bit. Um, so when you, when you power up the board, the FPGA is, is uh, well, actually, when you power up this board, it gets configured automatically by a, a flash chip on the board. Um, but if you didn't have that flash chip, you'd power it up and it would just be a total blank slate. Um, and in our case, you power it up and it does start doing stuff because it's, it comes up with the default configuration that comes from a non-volatile memory on the board. Uh, but then, of course, you can reprogram it. But anyway, so we're going to be taking, it's going to start as a blank slate and then um, 
you, um, you write the HDL code and it gets synthesized and ultimately it ends up as a digital logic circuit that gets programmed onto the FPGA and now you've made your hardware, right? Okay, so um, that's one objective is to learn HDL and FPGAs. The second is to give you an opportunity to build a CPU from scratch. So we want to design a large scale digital logic circuit. When I say large scale, I mean, uh, well, the FPGA has 115,000 gate capacity. Uh, although your design in this class will probably only use, you know, 10% of that or so. So your designs will be 10,000 gates or so. It's not really super large scale, but it's certainly large scale compared to what you did in 211, right? So you're going to be designing a CPU with maybe 10,000 gates and deploying it on the FPGA and then using it. And then you're also going to program the, 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 the CPU. So you're going to be writing a little bit of software. I try to limit it. I try to minimize this, but you write a little bit of software uh, and you're going to build the, the hardware. So you're going to write the software, you're going to write the hardware, and you're going to put them together and have it actually um, operate, right? Um, okay. So some of my colleagues, some of the, my colleagues that are more of the computer science persuasion um, have argued, you know, when we discuss curricular matters, um, you know, why study hardware design? You know, this course is, a, is, is hardware design. It's kind of the quintessential computer engineering course because you get to engineer a computer uh, from scratch. And so if someone may, you know, argue, well, what's the point of that exactly? What is that going to do for you? What benefit uh, is there? Um, and there's two arguments I often hear. The first one is CPUs are what's called Turing complete, which means you can solve, you know, any problem that can be solved with a computer can be solved with software, right? So there's no computation that is fundamentally requires hardware design because any computation that a computer can solve can be done with software on an existing CPU that you pull off the shelf, right? That's one. Two, software performance is, or at least was, driven by something called Moore's Law, which meant that if you write your software and you're not happy with how fast it runs, all you got to do is wait two years and run it on the next CPU and it'll be twice as fast, right? So there's no need to design custom hardware to solve a problem when not only can you solve any problem with software, but it also, software gets fast all by itself, gets faster, and it gets faster at an exponential rate, right? So those are the two, those are the two arguments, and this is why, by the way, you guys aren't using breadboards in 211. That's why you're not building circuits in 211 because of this argument. The, the 211 instructor said, yes, you're never gonna, not, not necessary, right? Okay. Well, my counter-argument to this is, uh, there's a couple things. Okay, number one, it is true that CPUs are Turing complete, which means that if you have software, you can run the same software on an 8-bit Arduino processor, the Atmega328. Some of you may have used that. In fact, you might have used that in 211. They replaced the breadboards with the gates with the Arduino, right? So that's a little 8-bit processor. It runs uh, very slow, 16 megahertz. Um, any software that will run that on that will run on a uh, desktop processor and any software that runs on a desktop will run a supercomputer. And conversely, any supercomputer software that runs on the biggest computer in the world will also run on the 8-bit Atmel processor because fundamentally any three of these classes of computers can execute the same programs, can solve the same problems, they're all Turing complete, right? The problem, one of the issues though with this is, is that even though they can all solve the same thing, there is a difference between these guys. Um, there's a practical difference. The Summit supercomputer, which was the biggest computer in the world for a while, has 2.4 million processors. It's 200 petaflops. It's 200 quadrillion operations per second. Uh, it takes 10 megawatts to run it. It's over in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, and uh, if, if you take the, um, the amount of uh, flops, flops are floating point operations, basically a, a unit of workload, a unit of computation, a workload, right? If you take the, the, the performance it gets and you divide it by the power, the 10, 10 megawatts is huge, obviously, but if you take the ratio between the performance and the power, it's doing about 20 gigaflops per watt. Uh, and that equates to, that, 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 those units break down into joules per op. So basically the amount of energy you spend per arithmetic, computa arithmetic computation it does, right? 
On the other hand, if you go to the Arduino processor, it is about 20 milliwatts to operate, which is great because these, these are so lightweight, you can, this is actually what powers the electronic greeting, greeting cards in the drugstore. You open the greeting card and they sing to you. That's what's running that, is one of these processors. Uh, so 20 milliwatts. So you might think, wow, that's really power efficient. Wow, that's amazing. 20 milliwatts to run a CPU. But if you take its peak performance, which is 200 kiloflops per second, and you divide it by its power consumption, it's about 2,000 times less efficient than the supercomputer. And the reason for that is that whenever you have a low power computer, it automatically makes it harder to achieve higher power efficiency, uh, energy efficiency. And you might say, why is a supercomputer more efficient? It's because of the economies of scale. It's huge. It's, it's more efficient because it's huge and bigger. And there's so many GPUs and CPUs in there. It's very difficult to design energy efficient, low power systems. And this is one of the objectives that, that, that uh, computer engineers are, are trying to con constantly improve on, is how do you get low power but also efficient? It's very hard. They're actually competing objectives. Um, another, another thing is, is that computer CPUs, general purpose CPUs, used to get faster if you buy, bought the next generation. They'd be faster. In fact, I remember a time in the 90s when every computer, I mean every desktop computer, had a button on the front that was labeled turbo. You guys are, I'm sure, too young to, to, to remember that. There used to be a turbo button. And the turbo button, when, it, when they, I first saw that, I was like, what the hell? I don't, what does that mean it's, it goes into turbo mode when you press it? No. Actually, what the turbo button did was funny. When the turbo button was on, it allowed the computer to run at its native natural speed. When you turn the turbo button off, it crippled the CPU. It downclocked it. Now, why would you ever want to downclock the CPU? You want it to run as fast as you can. Turns out that software in the 90s would often break if it ran too fast. For example, my favorite video game, Chuck Yeager's Adv Advanced Flight Trainer, which is a flight simulator, was too fast to play if you ran it on a 386 processor. It would run, it would just, the frame rate would be too high and the, 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 the time, the way the time advance in the game would be too fast. A lot of programs were like that. You would have to turn the turbo button off or it would break software. That's how much faster these machines got. But as you, I'm sure as you guys know, that's no longer the case. Um, if I, I always update this slide every time I teach this class. If you look at the last 10 years of Intel desktop uh, CPUs, so we're going now from the Ivy Bridge, which is the Core 3, that's the third generation core that came out in 2013, all the way to the Raptor Lake, which is the latest one, that's the 13th gen core. So there's a 10 year gap there. And if you look at all of the factors, all of the, the, the indicators of peak performance, when I say peak performance, these are the fundamental upper, upper limit, upper bound, the factors that determine the upper bound for these processors uh, about how fast they can be. So for example, technology is one, that's how small the transistors are. Now, technology, when it, whenever you hear about technology um, in terms of nanometers, that's the length of the transistors. That's the length of the transistors. There's also a width. And the width is generally five to 10 times the length, but they both scale down at the same rate, right? So when you scale down that number, you, the area that people are really concerned with is not the length, but the area. The area is actually scaling uh, as a square of that number, right? because it's the length times the width and they're both, you know, they're both dependent on one another. So that's one thing. So obviously as, as the technology scales down, you can fit more transistors, you could fit more cores, you could fit more cache, you could fit more stuff, you could fit more uh, floating point units, GPUs, memory channels, anything you want to put, you can fit more of that as you scale that number down. And then of course you've got the clock speed, right? The clock speed is constantly going up. You want that to run faster. Uh, you got things like integer IPC, that's the number of integer instructions that can be executed per cycle per core, right? Um, so basically it's the instruction width. How many instructions can we feed the pipeline in one cycle, right? In this case I list the integer. Uh, number of cores, right? More cores mean you can do more stuff at one time. Uh, DRAM bandwidth, that's the, basically the memory wall, how, much, how fast we can pull data out of main memory and feed the processor. Single precision floating point is just number crunching for floating, you know, floating point, like scientific code, uh, machine learning code, stuff like that. 
Uh, and level three cache is the amount of on-chip memory you have in the last level cache. So these are all kind of the indicators. You're not going to ever get 100% utilization. You're never going to hit the maximum upper limit of your performance. But these are the things that limit, that are, that are capping the processor performance. Now you can see that if you look over the past 10 years, you can basically see the performance per year, which is the, the newest number, right, divided by the oldest number, right, and you take the 10th root, right? That'll give you over a 10 year period. And of course, you could do this over a five year period or a 20 year period. I just chose 10 years. So for a 10 year period, you can find the, the, amount, of, the, the amount of improvement that you get per year. Um, and then uh, you can come up with the doubling time. The amount, the, the, you know, if, you, if you know how fast you're improving per year, you can calculate how long it would take you to double. Now you might say, why do you care about double? Well, that's what Moore's Law is about, doubling. It's doubled every 18 months. It's doubled every two years, right? That's what everyone said about Moore's Law. So how long does it take to double something based on a yearly improvement that you calculate over the past 10 years? Well, you can see that um, if you look at the technology, the number of transistors, yeah, it's 25% per year still to this day, which means that it's going to double, not every two years, about every three right now. Right? That's pretty damn good still. Because remember, Moore's Law said every two years you're going to double the number of transistors, double the performance, right? Well, the transistors, yeah, it looks like it's still going. Well, that's good. But then you look at the clock rate, it's only improving at 3%, so that would take 21 years to double. The integer IPC per core is doubling every 24 years or so. These numbers are rounded, obviously, so that's why there's 21 versus 24. Uh, the percentage is rounded. Cores is doubling every 10 years. Uh, DRAM bandwidth doubling every 5.5 years, so that's good. Uh, floating point, 6.8. Level 3 cache, 6.3. So the question is, why is it that the number of transistors seems to be doubling every three years, but every other performance indicator is not keeping at the same pace? That's kind of weird, right? Um, this is another plot. This is from the Hennessy and Pedersen textbook. This is, this is tracked over a long, longer period of time. And this one is not based on the key performance indicators that I mentioned. This is based on benchmark performance. This is actually running a program and timing it on all these machines. So this is actual performance. And so they took it all the way back to the 1978. And you can see that in order to double eight every 18 months, which is the original Moore's Law, you would have to have a 58% improvement every year. And in fact, they got almost that from 1986 to 2003. You know, you were doubling the benchmark, actual benchmark execution time was being halved um, about every 18 months or so, because it was a 52. Then it slowed from 2003 to 2011, it slowed to 23, and then from 2011 to 2015, 12, and of course now, as you might imagine, it's basically flat. Now again, this is even more pessimistic than my numbers, because my numbers are based on you know, essentially the, the amount of actual hardware available, right, which is limited by wiring and how to place them on the chip. This is actual runtime of benchmarks. So this is, as you can see, that according to this, CPUs haven't gotten any faster, really, since 2015, okay? So you might be wondering then, okay, so you say that CPUs haven't gotten any faster. What about all these new capabilities? Like we didn't have uh, self-driving cars before 2014. We didn't have 4K video on a phone until 2015. We didn't have Face ID till 2017. We didn't have Animojis till 2017. Didn't know computational photography till 2018. What about all these new capabilities that we have? If CPUs aren't getting faster, why can we do more with them than we used to be able to do? Well, the answer to that is, is the answer also to the question of why is it that Moore's Law is keep giving us more transistors but yet we're not seeing the CPU indicators go up. It turns out that those transistors are being used for coprocessors, specialized logic. In fact, if you look at the Apple chips from 2012 to 2016, I need to update this slide, but Apple's making it increasingly difficult to get these dye images. These are dye photographs, right? If you look at this, the, the, the area of this dye that I highlighted in, in, in white, that's the CPUs. Uh, so generally speaking, a mobile processor has about 12% of the actual transistors are for just the general purpose CPUs. The rest of it is all special circuits for specific things like the things I showed in the previous slide. All the face tracking, computational photography, video, 3D graphics, machine learning, security, encryption, all that stuff, all done with specialized 
hardware, not done in software. Not done in software. Because <laughs> if you do it in software, then you're back to basically 1997 capabilities, right? So basically, if you want new capabilities, like the kind that you were getting with these, these phones and, and computers, you gotta start designing circuits, not writing software. It's the only way. And that's the secret of, 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 the, of the, and you look at CPUs, like for example, if you look at the West Mirror, this goes back a little longer. So this is from 2010. The latest, latest CPU from Intel was called the West Mirror. And uh, one nice thing about Intel is they do release die photographs. Apple won't do that, but Intel is very proud of their pictures of their processors. And they, they not only, not only does Intel give the pictures out, but they label them for you. They show you, well, these are the cores, there's the cache, that's the uncore. The uncore is the part of the, that's, that's applied to all the cores. It exists outside the cores, right? So you can see there that in this case, 72% of the die area was CPU and cache. But then once we got to Ivy Bridge, which is 2013, you can see that the CPU cores shrank to about 47%. Well, what took up the extra room? The GPU is half the, sit, half the chip now. And the GPU is not a general purpose processor. It only does graphics and video, right? Then we get uh, to Broadwell, 2015, uh-oh. Now the CPUs are only 20% of the chip. Lots of other stuff on that chip. Lots of other circuits, you know, system agent, display engine, memory controller, eDRAM controller, memory controller I.O., processor graphics, lots of extra circuits on there, not just a CPU. Um, and in fact, modern, um, Modern uh, embedded systems have lots of different sort of special purpose circuits for doing things like machine learning and GPU, motion coprocessor. I'm sure you guys have probably heard of that. Um, deep learning accelerator, programmable vision accelerator, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, every chip has a proprietary mixture of these special purpose um, circuits. The CPU is an afterthought. It just does the it just runs the operating system, does high level management. All the heavy lifting, all the compute is done with special circuits. Uh, same thing in the data center. Now you might ask, well wait a minute, okay that's fine, but why is it that CPUs can't do that heavy lifting? What's special about these special purpose hardware? Like what's special about a circuit that you designed specifically to do Animojis? Like why is that can do Animojis a CPU can't? Well the reason is, there's two reasons. There's the memory wall and the power wall. The memory wall is that Performance is often li limited by memory speed, but if you have a special purpose processor, you can create a specialized memory on chip specifically for that application that's very efficient, right? So if you're doing machine learning, obviously you're putting a two-dimensional tile of a matrix on there, and then you're using an, an array multiplier to do a matrix vector multiply in one clock cycle, right? That's the idea. And then there's the power wall, and the power wall says that in, in a chip, you can only dissipate one to two watts per square millimeter. Any, any more than that and it just fries. Now CPUs c can emit more than one to two watts per square millimeter, but if they get to that point where they start to doing that, they have to turn themselves off. They have to throttle themselves, right? So that's called the power wall. It basically means that you can't use your CPU at full capacity or it'll melt, no matter what sort of heat sink or liquid cooling you have on there, right? So that's called the power wall, but DSAs, which are do domain-specific architectures, they get around this by basically devoting all of their hardware to that application, right? So they have none of the inefficiencies of a CPU that require all of this fetch-to-code logic to support general-purpose execution, okay? So anyway, um, yeah, so, but the real reason to study hardware design is that it's a special, it's, <laughs> you, you make about 60% more than a software person. <laughs> because hardware design is much more difficult than writing software and it's much more specialized. So if you get a job doing this, which it's harder to find a job because there, of course there's less hardware jobs than there are software, but if you get one, you're gonna make a lot more money because it's a much more uh, specialized area. Okay, so in this class, so hopefully I was able to answer, answer those questions. Um, in this class, we're gonna design a CPU from scratch. We're chosen, we've chosen now the RISC-V CPU architecture. You guys learned about MIPS and 212. It's very similar to MIPS. I'm just, we switched to RISC-V because it's the new exciting thing. Uh, MIPS is proprietary, um, but RISC-V is an open architecture, so we're going to just use that. We're going to deploy it on an FPGA, and the class is, um, 
is kind of split into two phases. In weeks one to 10, we're gonna be covering sort of skills. You know, how to design circuits on an FPGA. So you might look at that and say, yeah, it's kind of skills training. Uh, and it is. Uh, it's kind of vocation -y, vocational -y stuff. But the last five weeks, we'll get in more conceptual topics. But I have to front load the course with the stuff you need in order to do the labs, obviously. So, you know, you may get the sense in the first 10 weeks that, eh, it's just, we're just learning a new language. It's, you know, it's not, where's the concepts at? Where's the theory? Uh, we'll get into that in the last third of the semester. Okay, so again, first, first two thirds is engineering, last third is more conceptual. Um, okay, so um, now let's talk about assembly language for a minute. Now you guys, when you took 212, and again, I think I might get the same answer I got for 211, but when you took 212, half of that class should have been about learning assembly language. Okay, good. Glad, I'm glad, you, glad they haven't messed that up yet. <laughs> so there has been an internal discussion in the department going on for the last 20 years where some of my colleagues, again, the more computer science uh, types, say, why are we still teaching assembly language to our students? Because they'll never use that, ever. There have been compilers for 50 years that have made assembly language programming obsolete. Okay, so why are we teaching that? That's, that's dumb. Um, well, the problem is, problem with that argument, they wanna stop covering assembly in 212. The problem is, as you guys know, I'm sure you, you learned in 212 that, you know, the way that this works is you start with a high level language like C and it gets converted into assembly language by the compiler. The assembly language is the native language of the processor hardware, of the hardware, right? And then the assembly language is converted to machine language, which is just the binary form of the, the assembly instructions. And that's what's executed by the CPU, right? Now, it is true that none of you are going to write assembly language code in your careers, more than likely. However, if you don't learn how to write an assembly language, there's no way that you can do hardware design. Because basically, when you design a CPU, what you're designing is a circuit that executes assembly language. And so obviously you have to know the assembly language in order to design a circuit that runs assembly language, right? So that's why we teach it, right? It's not because we expect you to be writing long programs in assembly language. Although you may, if you know, some of these specialized processors, like if you're using the Google TPU, for instance, which is what Google uses to implement all the machine learning, it's assembly language. That's how they program it. But then again, it only has five instructions, so it's not too hard to program. But, um, but but you may have to write a compiler that emits assembly language for a new architecture. Who knows, right? People are going crazy these days with hardware designs to, to introduce these new capabilities. Uh, but that's the reason we teach it. So basically, if you don't know assembly, you can't build the underlying hardware. So there's some terminology here. There's instruction set architecture, which is the assembly language. That's, the, that's basically the software. That's, that's the software perspective. Right? And then there's the microarchitecture, which is the circuit that runs the assembly language. That's the bottom side, right? So basically, on the top side, you have these instructions, which represent the smallest amount of work that the CPU executes. That's like an, an, an atomic unit of workload, right? But then underneath that, you have a microarchitecture that's executing those instructions in clock cycles. So the, the work that's done, the data paths that are established in the hardware represent the atomic unit of work that's done when the hardware executes the program in assembly and machine language, right? Um, so in, in, in an instruction set architecture is a repertoire of primitive operations that can be executed by the CPU. Um, and you know, you, hopefully you remember from 2.12, there's compute instructions, data movement, like load and store, branch, and then you've got some miscellaneous ones like interrupt and exception handling instructions and that kind of stuff. Um, and, and it includes everything you need to be able to program. Typically, CPU instruction set architectures are open and freely available to everyone because they want people to know that so they can write software or write compilers that generate the software. Um, the microarchitecture, on the other hand, is a jealously guarded trade secret of all companies that make CPUs. So you'll never get a peek at the hardware that, make, that powers an Intel or the, you know, the Apple M1. You'll never see that. That's super, super secret. I've been working with Texas Instruments. They've been funding my research for 10 years, and even they, don't, they won't tell me anything about how their digital signal processors work. Super secret stuff, right? So on one hand, you've got the assembly language that's, that they try to disseminate that as much as possible, but then the underlying hardware is, is uh, always proprietary. 
And you, I'm sure you guys know there's different processors. There's, you know, Intel 86 has their own instruction set, and then you've got ARM, RISC, MIPS, and that kind of stuff. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so for example, like, j just to kind of drive the point home, a one line of C or C++ code that you write is generally going to be translated into one to ten instructions, assembly language instructions. One line of Java code is going to be executed at runtime by ten to a hundred instructions, and one line of Python code is going to be about a hundred uh, to a thousand instructions, right? So, generally speaking, the speed at which your program runs or that your programming language runs depends on how many instructions have to be executed for each you know, line of code that you write, right? That's why Python is much slower than C, right? Because it's a higher level language. Um, so instructions are identified like, you know, with mnemonics. And so I'm just going to quickly, I want to go, the first thing I want to cover in the course is uh, I want to go through uh, some RISC-V and just kind of review assembly language programming because generally what I find in this class is that um, students either didn't have assembly in 212 because they had an instructor that didn't believe in it, right? Or um, they forgot it because it was two years ago and they hadn't used it since they hadn't used it in two years, right? So I'm going to just go through this and as I mentioned too, we're using RISC-V which is also a slightly different assembly language than MIPS. Very similar though. If you remember MIPS, uh, you won't have any problem with RISC-V. Okay, so MIPS and RISC-V are similar. Um, they're both RISC architectures, and if you're wondering what that's all about, RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer, and that's as opposed to CISC, which is compl Complex Instruction Set Computer. And basically what that, the distinction there is, in a RISC computer, the instructions are very primitive. They, do, they don't do much. The amount of work that's done is small which means that the number of instructions is huge, which means if you have to write code in RISC assembly language, it's awful because you have to write, write lots and lots and lots of instructions even to do a simple program, right? Whereas CISC, on the other hand, does more in each instruction, okay? That's the difference. Now, um, the, you know, we used to debate RISC versus CISC and then RISC kind of won, right? But now it's kind of tipping towards the other way now because now you have things like the aforementioned Google TPU, Tensor Processor Unit, it's actually a CISC machine. It actually does a lot of work with one instruction. It's a whole matrix vector multiply in one instruction, right? So that's a lot of work. Whereas a RISC processor would just do one scalar operation per instance, one multiply or one add, or one load or one store or one branch. That's all it can do in one instruction. Whereas Google's TPU is doing, is doing thousands of multiplies with just one instruction of code, right? That's CISC. Right? The problem is, is that you know, CISC is harder to translate with a compiler, so that's why I mentioned that if you're programming for the Google TPU, you're probably going to be writing assembly language, because right? you need to do that often with CISC architectures. Uh, so there's this trade-off. So execution time, if you remember from 2.12, is the number of instructions executed time multiplied by the time per instruction. So the objective with RISC is to make the instructions very fast individually, uh, but the trade-off there is it requires more instructions to execute a program, whereas with CISC, you have less instructions per program, but the time required per instruction is much higher, right? So obviously a Google TPU, if you execute that matrix vector multiply instruction, it's going to take longer than a single multiply on a RISC architecture, right? But there's a trade-off. They're, they're inversely related if you're trying to minimize, you know, the execution time. Does that make sense? And that's generally what you're trying to do is minimize execution time with these things. Um, so a, a TPU instruction will take longer than a RISC instruction, but there's such a dramatic reduction in instructions, right? right? Because if you're multiplying a matrix with RISC, you have to have one multiply and one add for every element of your matrix that has to be executed, whereas the Google TPU just does one, one instruction for the whole thing, right? So that's why the Google TPU is faster, at least for, for things that do matrix vector multiply, than, than any CPU is, and that's why Google uses it. So there's that trade-off there. Okay, so you, you probably um, remember that MIPS and RISC and ARM and all the other RISC architectures, they generally have these things called registers. There's usually 32 of them. And these are, the, these are like little memory locations where you store intermediate results from calculations, right? So, um, and they're programmer-defined. You know, they're program-defined. So the program has to explicitly, you know, address the registers, right? And so, um, they, there's 32 registers, and if you remember from 
the MIPS, the registers in the program were denoted by a dollar sign, like dollar zero, dollar one, dollar two, whereas in risk they use X, X1, X2, X3. Why? I don't know. I just decided to change that, right? You might also remember that some of the registers had special names like S0 to S11, which were registers that were supposed to be by convention preserved across subroutine calls. Of course, again, that depends on the code. It's just a convention. It's not enforced by the hardware. Um, then you had temporary registers, T0 through 6, and th those mapped to specific register numbers. That's still all in place with, uh, with RISC-V as well. And so when you launch, we're going to use a simulator called RARS. I don't know, there was another one called MARS that was for MIPS. We're going to use RARS, very similar. I think uh, Poon Yan, when he teaches 212, he used uh, a SPIM, XSPIM or something like that. But the point is, is that it's a simulator um, and in the simulation window, it'll actually give you a table of all the registers and their special little symbolic representation. You can use either one when you write your code. Now you might say, wait a second, how much assembly code are we writing in this class? Not much. Um, but you just have to, you, have to, you have to understand it well enough to implement it in hardware. So in the first lab, we're going to write a, 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 the first lab will be to write a um, RISC-V program. And there's two reasons for that. The first is, is that you're going to use that program to test your hardware when you build your CPU. It's going to be a, a test program, a test bench, right, or a benchmark, think of it. Um, and the other reason we're doing it first is because I'm not going to have enough time to, I'm not going to have enough time to cover enough Verilog to have you do Verilog, to do the hardware design in the first lab, right? So it's a timing thing, right? So in the first lab, you're going to just write a, um, a small program that will calculate the square root of a number, right? And then we're going to use that to build essentially a calculator on the FPGA board, right? And the other, there's actually there's a third reason too we assign it first is because one of the common mistakes that students make in this class is in the past, before we restructured it, was that they would design, they would write the software and they design the hardware at the same time. And that was always a very bad decision because when things didn't work, then you didn't know if it was the software being bugged or the hardware being bugged, right? But if you write the software first and you test it thoroughly in the simulator, right, then you're guaranteed you know the software is bulletproof. So if you then run that on your hardware and something happens, now you know it's a hardware problem, right? So that's the other reason we've, we've set it up this way. Uh, okay, so let's see. RISC-V has a register zero. That's the constant zero. Same with MIPS. Um, and this is useful. You know, people ask, why do they do that? It's because um, it allows you to do things like, for example, you can move the contents of one register to another by adding it to the zero register, right? So this is a common, um, common thing, so stuff like that. You can use it as a baseline to build upon. Um, okay, so in this class, we're going to focus on six different types of instructions. Uh, and these are not really formalized types. They're just how we've kind of broke them down. Um, there's arithmetic logical shift comparison instructions, and these are what they use. These are these instructions use three registers. There's a destination and two source registers. Destination is first, not always first though. By the way, it's first in Risk V in MIPS. It's not first in Intel, and it's not first in like the Texas Instruments DSP. Right? It all depends on the instruction set. But in Risk V, the destination is always listed first. Um, then there are versions of those instructions that instead of having two source registers, they have one source register and an immediate, like a constant, a constant that's actually encoded in the instruction. You guys remember that? That's like for you know, adding one to a loop counter sort of thing, right? So we got some of those. Then there's branch instructions that generally test the contents of registers for equality or non-equality, or if one's less than another. And then if that condition evaluates to true, they'll change the control of your code. They'll go, they'll, they'll jump to another part of your code, right? And so that's used for if statements and loops, right? And then they have jump instructions, which are just unconditional changes of control. And uh, by the way, branch usually take two registers, test some, com you know, relationship between them, and then have a label that tells it where to go if the, um, if the condition is true. Uh, jump usually just has a label that goes to, and then you've got load and store, which pull data out of memory and put it into a register, a load, and a store is where you take a, a value and register and stick it into the memory, right? So generally speaking, 
uh, the way that the code works is you have to load stuff from memory, you do some number crunching on it, and then you save the result back to memory. So it's load, number crunch, store, right? That's generally the, 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 uh, uh, the structure of these programs. It makes sense because risk 5 is what's called a load store machine. You have to load and store explicitly uh, and then compute separately. Make sense? Okay. So, um, and then you've got some miscellaneous. We'll have this coprocessor instruction, CSRRW. We're going to use that to do I.O. So we're going to use that to be able to send results to the little hex displays on the FPGA board and also read the key values. Right? Now, one thing we're not actually going to put on the FPGA are load and store instructions. So we used to have a, a memory, a, um, um, an actual data memory, but that was one of the things we kind of dropped because it was getting hard to reach the end of the semester and have everyone finish. So we're just going to use, um, we're not going to have those, so we're just going to have basically the I.O. instruction that will read the state of the switches and buttons on the FPGA board. It'll do some number crunching and then it will output the, the, the outputs to the hex displays, right, the seven segment displays. And it'll do all that without a memory. So it'll do all that calculation just in the register file. So obviously, as you might imagine, we're doing a very simple program that can be done entirely just with the 32 registers. Okay, so uh, ni nice and easy. Um, because we don't want to turn this into a lot of assembly language programming. Because as I mentioned, you know, doing that programming in, in a risk instruction set is, is pretty tough, painful. Because it was designed for compilers in mind. Okay, so um, just to quickly review, you guys, hopefully, you, I think you, seems like everyone seems kind of comfortable with this stuff, right? This is all just meant to be a review. Um, so a typical assembly instruction would be like add, and then you give it three registers. In this case, I just say A, B, and C as a substitute for the registers. And that's like saying A gets B plus C, right? Now, by the way, this is a difference. Like, as I mentioned, a, a, a general purpose CPU is going to do one add at a time, right? But these new custom CPUs that are for machine learning, the whole point of them is that you're not doing one, you don't want to do one add. You're supposed to be exposing data level parallelism. You want to do thousands of adds in one instruction, right? Because you, you want to basically do what these tensor operations in hardware, right? As opposed to scale, this is scalar, one add at a time, right? Um, some CPUs, like the ARM and the Intel, they'll allow you to do vector operations, right? Like, for example, you can do 16 ads in one instruction, but still pretty small, right? Whereas GPUs allow you to do, you know, much larger scale data level parallelism, and that's why they're faster, right? So this is, I'm just kind of connecting this back to my original point, which is that CPUs are slow and not getting any faster. And this is one of the reasons they do one ad, you know, for example, per instruction. Um, okay, so for example, if you have a uh, if you have a high level code like this that has a uh, a compound arithmetic expression where I do basically two adds and a subtract, obviously that has to be broken down into three instructions. In this case, there's one instruction for each arithmetic operation. So if there's if you have one line of code and it has three arithmetic operations, that's three instructions that that correspond to that. And then, usually you're going to have to load the values of those variables with load instructions and then store the result. So actually, um, I'm going to need four load instructions to load G, H, I, and J as variables. Right? Those are variables. I want to load those. That's four instructions. Three instructions to do the arithmetic, so I'm up to seven. And then one to store the result F back to memory. That's eight. So that one line of code is eight instructions, but it's very easy to see how it becomes eight instructions, right? You got to pull the inputs, you got to do the computing, and you store the output, right? It's pretty straightforward, right? But that's one line of C code, very small line of C code, but eight instructions uh, to do that. And if you're writing an assembly language and not compiling, you have to write all eight instructions out, right? Okay, so, um, and then you've got these immediate instructions. I mentioned this earlier. This is where you have one register in an immediate. Uh, the immediate is actually encoded in the software. It's not changeable, right? That's a constant, right? It's immutable. So when you add four, that's always going to add four, right? Because that's been put in the code. And then um, one of the caveats here that there's no, there's no subtract immediate. There's an add. Oh, by the way, the, the immediates usually have an, a little I after the, after the mnemonic, right? So this is adding four to a value. That's subtracting one from a value. Okay. Um, Okay, I mentioned that you can only do operations on values and registers. You can't operate on memory locations. 
Um, so here's an example uh, of a small program in assembly. Now, one of the things is that, one of the things that's a little bit of a challenge in this class is that when you write an assembly, uh, some of the instructions you write are pseudo instructions. They get, actually, they're not one machine instruction. They may be one assembly instruction, but they get expanded into multiple machine instructions, right? That's a problem in this class because when you write code in RARS, RARS has an assembler that converts it to machine language, and then you're going to save that machine language as a text file, and you're going to load it onto the FPGA and run it on your processor. The problem is you may get fooled because your processor may see a different set of instructions than the one that you wrote if you use any um, pseudo instructions, right? So that can be a problem. I've had, I've had cases in this class where students had a pseudo instruction that actually overwrote register one in the expansion of the pseudo instruction. And then they tr and, and what ended up happening was is they were using register one prior to that and it got blown away by the expansion and then their code didn't work anymore. Uh, so that's something you have to be aware of. But I'll show you in RARS how you can verify that. In RARS, when you assemble your code, there's two columns. There's a column of assembly code and a column of machine code. And sometimes you'll have one assembly over here in this column and it expands out to like three instructions. So here's an example of that. So in this case, I'm loading, uh, I'm loading var, which is a variable, which I define in the data section. I'm loading var into register x2, right? The problem is, is that you can't say var in, a, in machine code. It's a symbol, right? It's a symbol that's stored in the symbol table and it corresponds to an address. That address is specified in the code as a base register plus an offset. So what ends up happening there is that gets expanded into three instructions. And this is weird. I don't know why RARS does it this way. I think this is strange, but it uses this thing called an AUIPC instruction, uh, which actually takes the program counter and adds a 20-bit immediate to it, right? So that's how it comes up with a base register address. And then it adds another 12-bit to that value, which gives it the, essentially, the, the, it fills in all 32 bits. And then it does the load with that register 2 as the base register, right? So in other words, it has to convert the symbol to a base offset style address calculation. Right. Now, like I said, we're not doing load instructions in our CPU, so that, that specific problem you won't have to deal with. But that's just an example of how uh, the assembler can trick you sometimes. The assembler is a little bit higher level of abstraction than machine code. Okay, um, there's also the stack. I'm going to skip that. Oh, we're probably not going to do stack stuff. Okay, so uh, let's see. How much time do I have left? A few minutes. Um, yeah, I'll just give you a couple of these. Um, so I just wanted to point out, I, I put together a list of what I consider to be the biggest challenges for writing assembly language. All right, the first one is, um, and I mentioned this earlier, you have to load all of your variables into registers before you can use them in store when you get back. So in other words, you can't use like, you can't add, you can't add G and H and put the result into foo. And assuming foo is your, you know, your what you call your temporary value that represents the sub-expression G plus H. You can't do that. You can do that on Intel assembly because it's a CISC architecture. But actually it's not. What happens, in, just a side note, I don't know if you, you might not care, but in assembly language on an Intel processor you can do that, but it actually gets transformed into this at runtime. Intel uses these things called micro instructions where they basically trick you into thinking that that's running on the hardware when in fact they have this thing that actually converts it in real time into this as you execute on the Intel processor. So they call these the micro code and that's the code right on Intel. So Intel actually has a risk architecture but they still present to the user a CISC interface, right? But it's all, it's all a front, right? But anyway, if you're actually using RISC and you don't have that ability, you actually have to write it out this way. You have to load, add, and store. Okay, so that kind of stinks because, and you might say, well, okay, I get it. It's a load store. It's not that complicated. What's the problem? The problem is remembering what register has what variable. That's the problem. <laughs> I never remember that. 
I can't keep track. I, I have to put comments, you know, after each instruction to try to figure out which register at which at which line of code has because you have to recycle the registers too. They have to get repurposed, right, when you're done with them. So every re every register is associated with a different symbolic variable at every line of code. You have to keep track of that in your head. That sucks. I don't like that, right? But unfortunately, now uh, Nvidia has a really cool solution to that. Nvidia's NVIDIA GPUs have an assembly language called PTX. PTX is kind of like Intel, where in PTX you don't actually give the register numbers. You just give symbolic registers, and then when you assemble it down to the, the, uh, the machine language for a, a GPU, that's when it maps the variables to registers. It does it during the assembler. That's cool. I wish that RISC had something like that, so then you wouldn't have to, then you could write something like this and you could let the, the assembler take care of figuring out what registers to allocate for each variable, right, and managing them. But unfortunately, we can't do that. We have to do it manually here. Does that make sense? Okay, sorry for the two side notes. <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone cares about <laughs> details. Um, okay, so one final thing I'll mention, uh, then I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up because I've, I've dumped a bunch of information on you today. Um, one of the other big things I hate about assembly language is when you write an if statement in a high-level language, the if part comes first and the else part comes next, right, in your code. If the if statement condition is true, it does the block of code at the top. If the if statement condition is false, it does the block of code at the bottom, right? That's an if then else statement, right? Problem is, is that when you write an assembly code, it's usually reversed. If, assuming of course, you're trying to minimize the number of instructions you want to use, right? So generally speaking, You'll take the condition A less than B, right? And you have to complement it, logically complement it. So you want to say if A is not less than B, if A is greater than or equal to B. So you say if A is greater than or equal to B, right? Then you skip down to the else part, right? And then if you fall through that condition, it means that A was less than B and you have the, the, the true part, right? Now, so you still have the true part above the not true part, but the thing that you test is the, has to be complemented. It's not A less than B, it's A greater than or equal to B, which is the opposite of A less than B, right? Now, you might say, well, come on, you, you, could, you could test, you could, you could still test if A less than B and then use a, combine that with the jump instruction and, yeah, you could. I mean, you could finagle this, but this is the most efficient way to write the if statement, which is where you have to logically complement that condition. That kind of sucks, too. I don't like doing that. I don't like having to reverse all my logic from the high-level code to the assembly code. But that's just a consequence of the assembly language. Does that make sense? All right, well, I'll let you all go. Um, I will, um, we'll have lab this week, and um, Probably we'll just use the lab to kind of finish up this lecture to get you started on the first project. Okay? Thank you. Oh, check, um, yep. think about who you want to have as your partner. And um, if you already know, email me the names. And um, also check out Dropbox. Make sure you can get in the course on Dropbox. You said two partners, right? Yes, two. Thank you.